29th of February, 1832. The day has passed delightfully. Delight is, however, a weak term for such transports of pleasure. I have been wandering by myself in a Brazilian forest. Amongst the multitude, it is hard to say what set of objects is most striking. To a person fond of nature, such a day as this brings with it pleasure more acute than he ever may experience again. Now, this is an extract from Charles Darwin's diary from The Voyage of the Beagle, and I chose this because it epitomizes what Darwin felt for nature, the sheer passion. And indeed, nature was his inspiration. Now, many of you out here may know actually much more about Darwin's work than I do, but what I want to explore is the emotional journey. What made this 20-year-old, 22-year-old young man, spotty youth probably, he was averagely clever, he did quite well at university, but nobody was describing him as a genius. What made him turn into this incredibly confident, clever, clever man who could come up with a theory so powerful that it shook the world then and is still shaking the world, particularly in the States. Um, <laughs> this, this journey I took in the footsteps of my great-great-grandfather. And along this journey, I had some uncomfortable questions. Are we actually less connected with nature than we were at the time of Darwin? Now, by nature, I mean biodiversity, I mean rivers, I mean the, the ocean, I mean everything living, everything vibrant. So let me take you back to September 2009. Now, Friday afternoon, I hand in my PhD thesis on genetics. Saturday morning, I go home and I pack for 10 months. Sunday, I load my 83-year-old father, my 75-year-old mother-in-law, my two children, six and four, my husband and I, into a car, and we drive down to Plymouth. And there, in Plymouth Harbor, is the most stunning boat, the Clipper Stad Amsterdam. We get on the boat, and on the boat, I should mention, there's an entire film crew, musicians, artists, historians, editing suites, fridges, freezers, air conditioning, all mod cons. On Monday morning, I wave goodbye, holding on to my two little boys' hands to the rest of my family, and off we go. Now, I'm going to say that South America was everything to Darwin, and I'm going to take you on a little journey to two places that we went to, that Darwin went to, that I think um, so show the extreme differences in what is happening now between humans and all things natural. So, if you can imagine that in 1830, Darwin lived in an environment where all the little hedgerows were beautifully trained, and there were fields and meadows and rolling hills, and you could just hear the clip-clop of the horses going down the lane. Very, very quaint environment. And Darwin arrives in Brazil, he steps off the boat and into this wild tropical forest. There's flowers smelling, there's rotting vegetation on the ground, there's sounds of birds and insects that he's never heard before. This is a complete assault on his whole being. He l runs out of words to describe the emotion that he feels on this immersion into nature. Now, we arrive in Brazil, and unfortunately, <laughs> things in this particular part of Brazil have changed. 
a lot of the forest that uh, used to be there is now missing along this Atlantic coast. And the towering trees have been replaced by tower blocks. The smell of the tropical flowers has been replaced by car fumes. And the sound of these exotic insects and birds that Darwin raved about has been replaced by street vendors and cars. So the experience was uh, different for us. We have nature, no nature. We have humans completely separated from nature. So Brazil, for Darwin, it was about biodiversity, discovery of why are there so many species in the world, so many species of beetles. He was just ran out of words. And for us, it was an environment that was really more or less entirely concrete. In fact, we had to drive an hour and a half away from the coast to find any tropical forest at all. And I'm going to move you swiftly down to the bottom of Tierra del Fuego, which is it's the tip of South America, an environment similar to the one that Vim has been experiencing. Incredibly cold. It was called Tierra del Fuego because the earlier travelers who arrived there saw fires on every headland. They saw these naked men with matted hair surviving and thriving in this environment. It was incredibly dangerous to sail there. The maps were terrible. The wind was unpredictable. It was altogether a, a very frightening place for these people. But Darwin saw these Yagan Indians, these native Indians in Tierra del Fuego, and realized that all humans belong to one species. And this started him thinking along the lines that, well, if all humans are one species, Maybe we have common origins. All animals and all plants, including humans, are all part of one group. So this is what Tyrrell del Fuego meant to Darwin. Now, the captain on board the Beagle uh, was determined to save these poor, apparently, savages from themselves. He wanted to convert them to Christianity. He wanted to start a mission. And the missionary failed, and it was tried again, and it failed again. These people really resisted, but eventually somebody actually succeeded in starting a missionary, and I'm afraid Darwin and Fitzroy's visit to Tierra del Fuego was almost certainly the beginning of the end of these native people. These people who were thriving in this environment, they were living in nature, in relative harmony in nature, and they have all but gone. When we were in Tierra del Fuego, there is one woman left, Christina Calderon, and she is the last pure-blood Yagan Indian. And for us, it was extraordinary. We walked through this pristine forest. It was springtime. All the leaves were coming out on the trees. And you felt that if you just listened really quietly, you might hear an echo of their voices or see a shadow disappearing through the forest. I've never felt that a natural environment so needed people. So in Tierra del Fuego, there was this pristine landscape, probably more or less as it was when Darwin and Fitzroy went on the Beagle, but there were no people, absolutely next to no people. So we have Brazil for Darwin, the biodiversity of life. Why was there so many species? What was all that about? And we have Tierra del Fuego, the, the idea that all life was interconnected. There was one common origin. That was for Darwin. For me, there was Brazil with lots of people and no nature. Tierra del Fuego with lots of nature, but no people. Now, I come back to this awkward question. Are we less connected to nature now? And I'm afraid the answer is yes. In a survey, they've discovered there's half the contact with nature in one generation. In other words, my children's generation spend half the amount of time in nature that my generation did. You could say, well, do we care? We seem to be doing quite well. Well, research also shows that we are, if we spend time in nature, we're healthier, we're happier, we're physically better, we cope with stress better if we have a bit of nature. 
And also, there's a man called E.O. Wilson. Some of you will have heard of his name connected with biodiversity. And he has come up with a theory that we are innately, genetically linked to nature. So, in fact, we actually need nature. And you could say, does nature need us? Well, again, research has actually shown that people who are engaged with nature also are more concerned about conservation. So, to the three questions, questions are we less connected? Yes. Uh, is this a problem for us as humans? Yes. And is it a problem for nature and biodiversity? Yes. Darwin found his inspiration in nature. He had a deep emotional attachment to nature. He discovered that humans share a common origin with living things. And a life that is worth celebrating reminds us how to live. So let us get out there, into the forests, into the parks, into the allotments, and go and rediscover our connection with natural things. And who better to guide us on this journey than the man who made the connection between humans and nature, Charles Darwin. Thank you very much. Thank you.